What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. All right, so for this case, we've got a 68-year-old man. He's presenting to his primary care doctor's office with shortness of breath and a dry cough that have been getting progressively worse over the last six months. So this is an older gentleman. He's kind of having these non-descriptive symptoms, shortness of breath, dry cough. They've been getting worse, definitely important to know, versus just staying the same. Six months, so it's not like these are happening overnight. It's more of kind of a, a slow, progressive process that's been happening over the last six months. It's probably something that's been happening even longer than that. It's just the underlying pathology, and it's just got to a point where it caused symptoms six months ago, and then it's continuing to get worse. So let's keep reading to see what else we find. Physical exam is notable for crackles on auscultation in both lung bases. So older guy, progressively worsening, shortness of breath, dry cough. A few things, definitely lung disease you want to be thinking about, maybe, maybe a COPD type picture, pulmonary fibrosis. On the cardiac side, especially with both sides being affected and at the lung bases, you definitely want to be thinking about pulmonary edema, possibly pleural fusion, someone who's in exacerbated heart failure. So definitely want to be considering that. You know, you could also see crackles with pneumonia possibly as well. Usually that's more so unilateral versus bilateral because it's usually, you know, a focal consolidation. But again, there are some examples of multifocal pneumonia, but usually I would think this patient would probably be a lot more sick if it was a multifocal pneumonia. So not as likely. So let's keep reading. They actually got a chest CT. So the chest CT showed multiple bilateral subpleural plaques. So whenever you see this, this is definitely want to be thinking about asbestos. So asbestos is a carcinogenic material. So typically when people think of asbestos, they think of insulation because homes that were built in the earlier half of the 20th century, the insulation actually contained asbestos in it. So people got exposed that way. There's certain industries where people have been exposed to it, such as roofers or shipbuilders types of industries particular people can get exposed to that, especially if they worked in those industries for a long period of time. There can be other things that, you know, you see these in, but older guy, shortness of breath, some crackles on auscultation, and then these findings on CT and nothing really else on CT. You know, it's not talking about cardiomegaly where there's a huge heart or, you know, a lot of pulmonary edema or anything like that. And there's no focal consolidation. There's no mass, you know, where you think about lung cancer or anything like that. It's talking about these very specific findings that would definitely tick you off for asbestos. So let's keep reading here. Patient has smoked one pack per day for 50 years. So that's a pretty extensive smoking history. You would traditionally think of COPD or emphysema. The thing is with emphysema, one, you're more so going to have wheezing on exam than crackles. And the other thing with that is, is that on CT, you're going to either, you know, there's pretty specific findings for emphysema. And so this patient may have some underlying early emphysema, but these bilateral subpleural plaques are not particularly specific for emphysema. And so definitely want to keep asbestos related kind of lung disease in mind here with this finding that we found on CT. They drink six beers per day, so not as relevant for the lungs, but always want to consider that. They have more than average alcohol use or heavy alcohol use for a long period of time. And then this last sentence here, he's previously worked in a shipbuilding yard for 40 years. So we were talking about shipbuilding being a risk factor for asbestos exposure, worked there for a long time. So this guy's lungs are probably not in that great of shape. He probably has gotten a significant amount of asbestos exposure. He smoked for a long period, had pretty heavily for a long period of time. And so that's the key thing. So like we always do, we want to summarize these key findings for you. So again, this is an older man with progressively worsening a shortness of breath and dry cough. The exam is definitely notable for bi basilar crackles, which again can be cardiac in nature, can be infectious. The fact that it's both sides, and then you also see these findings of the multiple bilateral subpleural plaques, and then the fact that he worked in a ship shipyard for 40 years. These all, you kind of have to tie it all together much more suspicious for pulmonary fibrosis picture here. And asbestos-related pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconioses are Pneumoconioses are kind of a category of lung disease that cause one of the causes of pulmonary fibrosis. Essentially, there are these diseases where patients are exposed to some type of material or 
chemical that they inhale over a long period of time. You also see it in like coal miners. There's coal miners pneumoconiosis and it deposits in their lungs and limits their causes like that restrictive lung disease, limiting their lungs and then also limiting gas exchange. So we get down to the question here, which of the curves from the graph to the right best represents this patient's condition? So it's asking which of these graphs correspond to really pulmonary fibrosis. As far as whether it's, you know, asbestos related or coal miners or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it doesn't really matter. The general ideas is that you want to apply your physiology. This is kind of a two-step question. One, you got to figure out the diagnosis and then two, you got to apply some physiology to that pathology to figure out where this patient falls on this graph here. And if we look at this graph, you know, if we go back here with the, if we take out the key findings there, you have length along the pulmonary capillary here, percent. So here's the beginning of the capillary, here's the end. So this is obviously going to be low O2 down here because you have venous blood coming through the pulmonary artery from the heart. And then down here, you're going to have high O2. So this is after it's been oxygenated by the alveoli. And then yeah, on the y-axis here, you have the pulmonary capillary partial pressure of the gas. Usually, in most cases can be oxygen, but you can do it for carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and so on. And so you're looking at the point where you reach the alveolar pr partial pressure of this gas, which in oxygen case would be 100. And so you're looking for when you you know how fast, and then at what, and if you do reach equilibration with that. So to further understand this graph. Let's first look at this diagram here and let's go over what's called Fick's law because Fick's law is really it's the rate of gas diffusion which is V here and it corresponds to the pressure gradient remember gas flows from high pressure to low pressure so the gradient here in this case is big A O2 alveolar O2 minus small a arterial or capillary O2 so the gradient between the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli versus in the capillary and then times the diffusion coefficient of the gas. So that's just the inherent chemical nature of the gas, how easily it crosses, you know, a membrane. Then you have A, which is the surface area. So obviously the, you know, it's in the numerator here. If you remember your basic math skills, you increase this, you're going to increase the rate of diffusion. That makes sense. You just have more area for that gas to diffuse across. And so then the last point here is if you have thickness. So if you increase the thickness, you know, you have a lot, you have more material or more tissue to travel through. So that's going to slow it down. So obviously if you, it's in the denominator here, you increase thickness, you're going to decrease the rate. Kind of an analogy I like to think about here. So here you have the blood here where it's coming from the venous side. The partial pressure of oxygen in the venous blood is about 40. Remember, it's not zero. You don't get rid of all your oxygen. You have still some of it left over. So you're about 40. And then the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is 100. So you have this gradient here. You know, 100 is obviously considerably bigger than 40. You have this oxygen. And so as this column of blood flows along, you're going to be exposed to oxygen diffusing across down that gradient. Now, remember, and we say normal here because this is presumably a healthy individual at rest, meaning they're not exercising. And you'll see that why that's important at rest versus exercising in a minute here. So you have O2 that binds to hemoglobin. So the partial pressure of oxygen doesn't correspond to the oxygen bound to hemoglobin. So you have hemoglobin bound to oxygen, and then you also have the free oxygen or dissolved oxygen in the blood. And this is what corresponds to this partial pressure of oxygen. So you've got to saturate all your hemoglobin before you reach your maximum amount of free oxygen or partial pressure of oxygen in the blood here. And we talked about hemoglobin binding to oxygen in our previous Da Vinci cases, so you can check that out. So at a certain point, you know, you've got to give it time to saturate all of the hemoglobin. And at a certain point, you're going to saturate all that and then that you're going to have the free O2 build up and then the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is going to equal the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. So 100 equals 100. So if we look at down here, typically, you know, you got to give it a little bit of time, but it doesn't take the whole capillary, especially a normal resting individual. It actually is about a third of the way down. So if we go here's zero, here's the full length of the capillary. So if you go down here, here's about a third. If we go up here, boom, right there. So this looks like the curve right here corresponds to a normal person at rest. And what's important to know is that this is perfusion limited. So there's diffusion limited and perfusion limited. Perfusion limited, it's pretty straightforward. It's limited by blood flow. So the ability to oxygenate this blood is actually not limited by the diffusion. It's limited by the blood flow. And so one way you can increase the blood flow 
is increase the cardiac output. And one way that happens is, for example, during exercise, which we'll talk about in a second. What's important to know about this is that at a resting state here, you equilibrate pretty quickly and you actually have a lot of room here. And so, you know, the reason why it's important to have a lot of room here is that if you're moving blood faster, you're not, it's going to take a little bit longer to fully oxygenate the blood because you've got to max out the hemoglobin and max out the free oxygen in the blood. And so you still got to give it time to fully reach a hundred. Now, as long as you reach a hundred by the end, it doesn't really matter how you get there. You know, whether you fully saturate here or, you know, if it's more three quarters of the way down, or even if it's just in time by the end of the capillary, it doesn't really matter. As long as you get to a hundred, you got to a hundred. And so what's important to know about this is that it gives you some reserve. So if you're resting and so then you start exercising and you increase this cardiac output and it takes a little bit longer for the oxygen to fully max out in the blood here, that's okay. You're going to still get there in time. And that's an important concept to understand here. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break from the case right now to let you know that DaVinci Cases is brought to you by DaVinci Academy, which provides online video courses for the medical basic sciences. These courses are taught using a variety of teaching methods, including bullet point outlines, diagrams, radiology images, and chalk talks to explain the fundamental concepts. We then teach the application of those concepts to numerous clinical pearls that are frequently tested on medical school exams and the USMLE. Our video courses are available on our website, dviacademy.com, as monthly subscriptions starting at $9.99 per month. Each video course has a corresponding outline format textbook as well. You can find the link to our website in the description below. Also be sure to use the discount code DC20 to receive 20% off any of our video courses. Now back to the case. So again, we talk about exercise. Again, everything's the same here. Fixed law, every th component here is the same. The partial pressure gradient is the same. You still have 40, you still have 100. You still have the same amount of oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. You still get to 100 eventually. Everything, the, the thickness here is the same. The surface area is the same. All of that's the same, which you've just increased as a cardiac output. One thing I like to think about with fixed law is so let's say you've got a column of blood here moving across and you're basically trying to put oxygen into it. So let's say you had, you know, you're standing here and this is the circle. And let's say there's a wagon that's kind of moving across and you have 10 balls to throw into that wagon. So if the wagon's moving at one mile per hour, it's going to be much easier than if the wagon's moving at 25 miles per hour. You're gonna be, it's going to be easier to throw more balls in. The wagon's going to move farther along for you to get all 10 balls in if it's moving 25 versus one mile per hour. Same thing here, if you look at, for example, the thickness, if you're standing two feet away versus 20 feet away, it's gonna be a lot easier if you're two feet away versus 20 feet away. We'll talk about that, more about that in a second. So what I'm getting at is that you're still gonna max out the hemoglobin bound O2 and the free O2. It's just gonna take you a little bit longer. And so it's just gonna happen a little bit further along down the capillary. And so if you look at the curves here, this one starts at zero, so it can't be this one. And so you look at this, we know this is normal. This one, if you look at this one, this starts here at the same spot at the 40, but it doesn't ever fully get there. You don't ever fully max out the amount of oxygen you can have in the blood versus here you get there. It doesn't happen as fast as normal, but you still get there. So I would say B most likely corresponds to exercise and for oxygen. And this actually is what's called diffusion limited. So in exercise, it actually moves more into diffusion because you've essentially your cardiac output is maxed out. You can only max it out so much at that point. You're moving at a fixed speed of cardiac output at that point. Then it's, you know, how much more oxygen can you diffuse across to get into the blood? So it kind of switches at rest. It's perfusion limited because you need to increase the blood flow, but at exercise, your cardiac outputs reached a certain point that blood flow is traveling at a certain speed. Now it's more on the oxygen's level ability to diffuse across. So let's talk about pulmonary fibrosis. So where fixed law particularly comes in, as you can see this here, remember this is where I talked about in pulmonary fibrosis, and for example, our patient as, that has asbestos, you have these material that builds up and builds up in the lungs and restricts breathing in and, and restricts lungs volumes, but it also restricts gas diffusion because you've increased the thickness. Remember, this is you know a much thicker, it's a longer distance. And kind of using that example again with the wagon, throwing balls into it, if you're only two feet away versus 20 feet away, 
this is much harder to do. You got to have a better arm. You know, it's you're not going to likely you're not going to get as many balls in as as you would if it was you know you're just tossing it two feet. So same thing here. Pulmonary fibrosis. You're still going to start with around the same level of oxygen. We'll just say 40 in this case, and then you have 100 here. So you kind of have that same gradient. The problem is if you increase the thickness, so right away you're going to decrease the rate. And the problem is, is this is so thick that you can only move so much oxygen across, and you don't, unfortunately, for these patients, even across the whole col the whole length of the capillary, you don't ever get back to 100 typically. So if we come back to the graph here, if we look at this is normal, you reach it about one third. Here in exercise, you've gotten maybe three quarters of the way here. And then if you look at this curve, now again, it's not D because you this is saying starting at zero, you've got some oxygen. If you didn't have any oxygen, you'd be dead. So even in pulmonary fibrosis, you still have a basal level of oxygen here in the venous blood, and it's still going to be relatively around a healthy individual. You get closer here. The problem is, is you never get back. You know, you move closer and closer and closer, but you don't ever fully get back to 100. It doesn't ever fully equilibrate. There's still some left. You didn't fully max out the amount of oxygen you could have. And so C most likely corresponds to a patient with pulmonary fibrosis. And that is our answer. But let's just for completeness sake, cover the last line here for carbon monoxide. And again, this is diffusion limited because you're limited by the ability of the gas to diffuse across. And it's limited by because you know you have increased thickness here. And that all goes back to fixed law down here. Lastly, with carbon monoxide. So remember, you're starting out with zero. This is really important to remember. You're starting out with zero levels of carbon monoxide when you start breathing it in. And carbon monoxide pretty readily binds to hemoglobin, very high affinity, even higher than oxygen. And so you are going to be binding to hemoglobin and then you have, you know, it's the same concept as oxygen. The problem is that you've, you have a much bigger ground to make up. Remember in oxygen, it was roughly 40 versus zero. So even if you got to the point where you fully saturated all the hemoglobin, you still got a lot of room left because you, you know, you started with zero. And so the gradient never fully equilibrates. It actually doesn't really ever come close because you have such a high amount of oxygen here and such a low amount to start with. And then essentially you, as you saturate the hemoglobin, it's the same thing as oxygen. This doesn't contribute these, these carbon monoxide molecules bound to the hemoglobin. This doesn't contribute to the partial pressure. Remember the partial pressure is only what is free unbound carbon monoxide. And so as you saturate this and move across and keep saturating and keep saturating, it doesn't really matter because you still haven't really done much. It's really after you saturate, then you can start contributing to the partial pressure of carbon monoxide. And that only reaches a certain level here by the end. So if we look here again, applying this to the graph, we start out here at zero because you don't have any carbon monoxide. And then eventually you don't ever fully equilibrate with the carbon monoxide level in the alveolus. And so you only get partial the way here. So curve D corresponds to carbon monoxide. And again, this is diffusion limited because it's not a matter of the blood flow. It's just a matter of how much can actually diffuse across here. All right. So to close this out, we'll just review this graph in total with the different answer choices. So remember answer choice A is O2 normal and arresting individual. Answer choice B is during exercise. Remember C eventually gets back to equilibration with alveolar O2. Answer choice C is corresponding to the diffusion of O2 in pulmonary fibrosis. And then answer choice D is carbon monoxide. And to close this out, our patient has asbestos related pulmonary fibrosis. So answer choice C would best represent our patient. All right, that's all I have for you this time. Be sure to check out all the DaVinci Cases videos available on our YouTube channel and our website, dviacademy.com. The PDF notes for every DaVinci Cases is also available on our website. Also be sure to check out our podcast, The DaVinci Hour, where we interview attendings and residents across medicine to learn more about their experiences, their specialties, and to get their insights on navigating a career in medicine. You can find The DaVinci Hour podcast on our website or any platform where podcasts are found. Lastly, you can find all of our video courses and corresponding outline format books on our website. Don't forget to use the discount code DC20 for 20% off.